So adverse impact differs from disparate treatment. Um, and again, why I call it um, adverse impact versus uh, disparate impact. Again, it helps to really differentiate the two terms and make it easier to recall what each one does. Disparate treatment is purposeful treatment. I purposefully treat you different because you are a woman, because you are African American, because you are a Muslim. Um, I'm going to treat you different because you're a member of that category, whatever it is. And it's a very purposeful and intentional um, act. I am holding you to different standards. I'm holding you to perhaps higher standards, more difficult, more stringent standards that you have to leap over in order to get into a particular job. And that's inappropriate. That's illegal discrimination using um, um, disparate treatment. Adverse impact is um, unintentional. It may, we're holding everybody to the same standard. You know, I'm holding you and I to the same hiring standard. You have to score an 80 or above in order to be hired. But what we're finding is um, that there are less women and minorities that are passing those tests. They are less likely to score well and they're less likely to get those jobs because the criteria that you're using equally for everybody may be having an unintended impact against the group. Now there are times when we set a standard, we say this is the standard that people have to have to get in that job, it's validated, it's legitimate, it absolutely makes sense, it's a great predictor and we're still going to have less women and minorities because they can't seem to pass that threshold of success and we see this um, you know, with firefighters. We see less women and minorities in firefighting because the physical requirements for that particular job are pretty high and they're legitimately high. Um, and, and if you can't physically do that job, there's no reason for you to be in there and that's not considered adverse impact. It's adverse impact if we're using a criteria that seems stringent and it's unnecessarily stringent. And the, the key case to this one was Griggs versus Duke Power. <clears throat> and in this circumstance, Duke Power had decided that they wanted to use a high school diploma to pre-screen for some jobs um, at, at Duke Power. Um, the problem was that, A, historically, people could do this job without a high school diploma. So, yes, it's not unreasonable to say, well, you know, you need a diploma to do this job, but historically, no one has ever needed a high school diploma to do this job. They've been able to do the job successfully without a high school diploma. So if you can do a job successfully without a high school diploma and you're not changing the nature of the job, then creating the barrier of having a high school diploma can be a problem. So it's an unintended consequence, right? You're removing people who don't have the diploma, which in and of itself is not the problem. It's, it's the circumstance that came up um, number two for Griggs versus Duke Power was that African Americans in this particular geographic area were less likely to have high school diplomas because of Jim Crow and because of historical racism and and um, you know the separate put equal um, uh, situation in the school districts they were less likely to finish school to, to get the resources they needed to complete school and so <clears throat> the problem in and of itself again wasn't that they were expecting the diploma. Um, it was the combination of the diploma wasn't needed. It was an unnecessary barrier to do the job because people could do the job without the high school diploma and it had an unintended impact against the African Americans who were less likely to have the, to have the diploma. And they were able to do the job historically without the diploma. So, of course, that established adverse impact as a form of sex discrimination and um, Griggs, of course, you know, you know, got his job and, and, and they got rid of the high school diploma as a criteria for this particular job. Um, and this, you know, again, if someone can do the job and they, without the criteria, then the criteria is useless. So we get rid of the criteria and that's how we sort of check this. And, and so we, to make your prima facie case, you have to have a, a number of cases in order to be able to do a statistical analysis, right? And so what we want to look at is historically three, three factors. We want to look at the flow statistics, we want to look at the stock statistics, and we want to look at the concentration statistics. The flow statistics are at the rate at which people flow into the company. You know, from the selection pool, the rate at which we hire them. And so we're going to compare the selection ratio of the, of the two groups, the majority and the minority group, however we define them, and, and to see if they're comparable. And how do we determine if they're comparable? Well, it's about the 80% rule. We, we, we take the ratio of the, the majority group, the one with the higher ratio, and we multiply it by 
four-fifths or 80%. And then we compare that to your minority group. And we, we compare that to ensure that even if you're making an adjustment, like within 80%, you know, we should be hiring at the same ratio within 80%. We compare and contrast and we look at it and we go, you know, the minority group is not even meeting that minimum threshold of that 80%. And so if they fall below that threshold, even if you adjust it down and they're still not hitting that threshold, even if you're still hiring women and minorities, you know, or, even, or actually we could even consider white males within this as well, and we could talk about that in class. Um, you know, if that minority group is not even meeting that threshold, that's a problem. You know, you can be still hiring them, but if they're still not meeting that minimum threshold, there's a problem. There appears to be an adverse, unintended impact on this group because they're not being hired at the same rate or a comparable rate. With stock statistics, it's about comparing the ratio of, of individuals or the percentages of people in my company as compared to the local labor market and what should technically be available. Now, way to sort of simplistically explain this is looking at qualified women, um, you know, in your local area and and comparing that to the qualified women in your company, and you can look at qualifications through all sorts of surveys and, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics analyses. Another com, you know, way of describing this, right, if you're a, a company in East St. Louis and you hire 75% white people and no African Americans or Latinos, again, you're demonstrating, you know, how do you demonstrate that you are not hiring in an unrepresented way? Well, you need to look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and see what percentage of people living in East St. Louis may have the credentials that you're looking for and that's it is gotten it's very easily gotten so that's our concern so um, we're going to look at whether or not your company sort of represents the local area I mean if you are in you know very white bread northern Wisconsin where it, there's no diversity then your stock statistics aren't relevant here right I mean it's it's if it's all white, then you're not expected to hire more than people who are white in that area. I mean, it's it's just the way it works. And the same thing, again, if you were the majority group happens to be African Americans and, and white people are complaining they're not being hired at the same rate, again, if, if the percentages of Af if white qualified whites in the area are really low, again, it's not necessarily a problem. Um, so it really kind of depends on what's in my labor market, what's in my geographical or my relevant labor market, and comparing that to what I have in my company and making sure that there's within that 80% that it's relatively reasonable. In terms of the concentration statistics, again, we can have a circumstance where, um, you know, we're hiring an enormous amount of women or we're hiring an enormous amount of African Americans or Latinos, but they're in jobs that aren't advancing. They're in jobs that are very limited in terms of their mobility. They're not going very far. They're never going to get beyond the level they're at. And so imagine you're in a circumstance where your company has 65 or 70 percent women, which you say, woo, 70 percent women, but all of them are in clerical jobs or jobs that aren't going to advance. Um, and that's a problem. They're not going to ever make it to that top management team because of that glass ceiling because we've sort of corralled them into particular jobs that aren't going to go anywhere. They're not going to grow in advance um, and have those same opportunities. So um, with concentration statistics, we have to look at, yes, we could be very diverse in, in gross numbers, right? And, and, but we have to look at where their pockets, you know, are they in pockets of jobs that are mostly clerical or laborers or they're not going to move ahead and all the important high-powered, high-paying advancement type jobs are going to um, you know, white folks or, or going to white men or going to women, right? It could, you know, certainly could be that way as well. So we want to be really careful of looking at where people are sort of being corralled in their jobs and are they being corralled into jobs that are not going to have the kind of advancement we're looking for. So basically how adverse impact then works is we turn around, we say, you know, I think that there's a problem with the hiring rate of this company we get the data, we do the analysis, we go in and we say, hey, look, there's an adverse impact here. The onus then falls on the employer to say, yes, we may be having an adverse impact, but the selection tool I'm using is good, it's valid, it's legitimate. In which case, if it's a good, valid, legitimate tool, there's not much you can do about it. Um, but if they can, sh if, if it's a situation like Duke Power where they're saying, well, hey, you know, you don't have a high school diploma, but the high school diploma is not needed, it's not valid, it's not legitimate, it's not needed, then that's a problem. That's the adverse impact. 
how do we that how would how do we combat this you know within the organization clearly one of the things we need to be focusing on is making sure we are not um, using only using tools with that give adverse impact and there is a huge battery of, of selection tests that we know certain ones have adverse impact and certain ones don't so if we're only using tools that have an adverse impact to make all of our hiring decisions this is a problem for us one of the things we do to combat this is we use the tool with the adverse impact and we use this in conjunction with tools that don't have an adverse impact because then what we can look at is what is um, what impact does the pocket, um, the package of tools that we're using, um, what impact does that have on people? Any particular tool may have an adverse impact, but if we use it nominally in conjunction with tools that don't have an adverse impact, but we, we know that we're getting some good information on, on really the quality of people's abilities, um, we can use it in conjunction with other tools to minimize that the, the adverse impact that we're having, and that would be at least minimally what would be expected of us um, if we find that some of our tools are creating an adverse impact. If we find that the tools are uh, not legitimate, clearly then we have to get rid of it, like the, the high school diploma example. But if we know, for example, a cognitive ability test tends to have an adverse impact, um, we want to use the cognitive ability test test in conjunction with other tools that may not have an adverse impact in order to get some of the good information we could get from a cognitive ability test when we make our hiring decision, but use it in conjunction with other tools that are less likely to have that impact so that the, the impact of our overall selection packet or a selection system is minimized. Okay, if that makes sense.